Today we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, I want to share with you out of verses 15 through 19, and so if you've opened your Bible to that portion, let me read to you beginning at verse 15, reading to verse 19, and then we'll get into our study this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 15, reading to verse 19. Paul writes, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We're going to be looking at these few verses today, and we're looking at the subject of the unashamed worker. Now, Paul is giving Timothy some instructions concerning the message that is called the message of the gospel. And he's been telling him to keep a firm grip on this message in a personal way, as well as committing the same message to those who are faithful, who can take it and commit the same message to others, and so that the, uh, the Word of God can have an unbroken line from one faithful minister to another. He had said that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, when he said, These things that, ha- that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Paul has been writing here in 2 Timothy to a pastor who is pastoring in the magnificent city of Ephesus, uh, a pastor who is undergoing a certain conflict both within and without that congregation, and he's writing as an encouragement to him. And he's telling him that he needs to remain faithful to the calling God has given to him and to continue to give out the message even as he himself had received it. He is to have a thorough knowledge of truth. He's to have a thorough knowledge of truth in order that he might be able to equip the people to also have a thorough knowledge of the truth so that they might be able to recognize and refute error when they encounter it. And that's what Paul is saying here, and that's what he was saying in verse 14 when he had said to Timothy, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. He wanted Timothy to constantly remind ministers in the church as well as the congregation itself concerning the essentials of the faith. Because if they are well taught and if they are well grounded in the basics of Christianity and Christian belief, then they're going to be able to to be safeguarded against being taken captive by false teachers who come in and undermine faith and corrupt the walk of believers. And that's what Paul has been speaking about. He's encouraging Timothy to be a diligent teacher. To be a diligent teacher first requires him to be a diligent student. But as a diligent teacher, he's going to be able to be used by God to communicate God's timeless truth to people who are willing to hear. You see, the diligent teacher is to do his best to equip believers with correct and clear doctrine. In that way, God can safeguard the church from error. In the book of Ephesians, if you take notes, it's found in uh, chapter 4, verses 11 through 14. In Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 14, Paul writes that God himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And so he is to safeguard himself from error as well as safeguarding the church from error And God has gifted the church with pastor teachers who are intended to equip the saints for a work of ministry that they might become mature. That's what he means by becoming a perfect man. The word perfect means a complete person or somebody who's brought to a maturity. That's what God has called pastor teachers to do, that they are not tossed to and fro with every hurricane of doctrine that enters into that church building, but that they remain solid, stable, steadfast in the things of God in order that they might be able to be used by the Lord to communicate His truth to other people. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to remind the church of basics, of the essentials. And so as he does so, in verse 15, he says, Be diligent, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, 
a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so he says you need to be diligent. Diligence is a zealous persistence to accomplish a particular objective. You are to be diligent. You are to be diligent, Timothy, that you might please God. You are to be diligent to first and foremost be pleasing to God so that you are not tempted to fall into the trap of being pleasing to man. Because if you're busy trying to be pleasing to man and saying the things that men want to hear, you will not tell them the things that God wants to say to their hearts. You won't. You'll avoid it. You'll avoid the things that create conviction. You'll, you'll avoid the confrontation that sometimes Scripture has with our lifestyles. You, you'll avoid those things because you're going to be ashamed and afraid of causing waves. Even in this day, we have a saying amongst us who are ministers, nickels and noses. You're going to be afraid of losing money and people. And if you're afraid of that, then you're never going to speak the truth. You speak it with love. You speak it with courage. You speak it with uh, conviction. You speak it in such a way that, that, that people see a passion in your heart. You need to do that, but you do it not to be pleasing to the men so they can walk out and say, oh, that person speaks well. You speak it because you're pleasing God. And that's how it works, Timothy, and that's how you're supposed to be. And so for those who perhaps are in this room right now who are ministers or perhaps are people who feel a sense or a call to ministry, that's a key thing for you too. To speak the truth in love and to speak it with conviction and courage because it's necessary to be spoken, especially in these last days. So be diligent to please God. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God is what he is saying here. So please him. In First Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul said, we, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. He said, we are approved by God and we have been entrusted with the gospel. When Jesus was speaking to one of his apostles, the apostle Peter, on one occasion, he said to him, I give to you the keys to the kingdom. And, and uh, to hand those keys over to, to, to the Apostle Peter was a dramatic thing. But he not only gave him those keys to, to Peter, but he gave them to the rest. He gave them to the other apostles who had the responsibility of taking this message that actually opens the door to heaven so people can enter in. And this is what we have to understand, that when God gives to you and God gives to me the gospel, this message, it's intended to, to usher people into the presence of God. And therefore, we have the responsibility uh, to be able to communicate that as pleasing to God and not to man. If you were to be reading the newspaper today, the, uh, the uh, bulletin, the daily bulletin that's published in this is sold throughout the Inland Empire here. Uh, somebody writes in the letters to the editor. Perhaps this morning you, you read letters to the editor. I did. And as you read it, one individual who lives up in Upland was saying something concerning uh, the fact that somebody wrote a letter to the editor and quoted Moses. And this guy is saying that anybody who quotes a dead man needs to seek psychiatric help because he's quoting some dead person. And he said, I would, I'd like it if, if people would stop using the uh, public forum to to write religious opinions, put these scriptures and these quotes that they like to quote, put them in uh, the religious section of your newspaper, but keep them out of the letters to the editor. And I find that highly offensive and irregular and absolutely wrong. It seems that those who tout tolerance and, and diversity, uh, as long as it applies to the things that they like, are more than willing to encourage you to it. But if you say something that they don't like, they get upset, write letters to the editor and want people like me and you to be to be quiet. We're supposed to be quiet little Christians, kind of minding our own business, sitting in church today, but not actually living out the messages. Paul would say hogwash. That's nonsense. We are supposed to. We have the responsibility of taking this out to the street. We only gather here on Sunday mornings to be equipped, but we are equipped for works of service. So we leave this place and we feed ourselves daily the word of God so that we might live it before people and encourage them. Because Jesus gave to Peter as Peter gave to, as he gave to the other apostles and, and then they have given to us the word 
of life so that we take this message to the streets so that people might know Jesus Christ, that their life might be changed so they can be set free from the sin that they're in bondage to and they can be something that actually is usable by God. They can become light and they can become salt and they can be transforming people who help others to be transformed. I'm thankful that somebody took the message and communicated it to me 30 some years ago because my life was radically transformed from that point and I'm assuming most of you are grateful that somebody told you the truth and set you free from the things that you were in bondage to. That's what we're called to do and that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Be diligent. Study to show thyself approved unto God and that's what we're called to do. To be diligent to do that. Now the word diligence there as he's speaking concerning that is speaking of a zealous persistence to accomplish a particular objective. Be diligent to please God. Now, he says, study to show yourself approved or be disciplined to show yourself approved. Now, to be able to be approved by God, I need to put my whole heart into pleasing the Lord. That word approved means acceptable. It speaks of being tried and proven, tried and proven genuine. In the ancient world, there was no banking system as we know it today, no paper money. All money was made from metal, heated until liquid, poured into molds and allowed to cool. When the coins were cooled, it was necessary to smooth off the uneven edges. The coins were comparatively soft, and, of course, many people shaved them closely. In one century, more than 80 laws were passed in Athens to stop the practice of shaving down the coins then in circulation. But some money changers were men of integrity who would not accept counterfeit money. They were men of honor who put only genuine, full-weighted money into circulation. These men were called dokimos, or approved. And that's what he's speaking about. You need to be approved. You need to be the genuine thing. And you are to be diligent to show yourself approved. You see, approval results from being tried by God and proven genuine in your faith and love for Him. You are proven to be genuine by God Himself. Not just by people who will consider you to be approved, but, but really it's, it's God who is the one who approves us. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul said, We are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. He said, we don't peddle the word of God. We don't transform it. We don't change it. We don't make it acceptable to people. We, We know that this message that God has given to us is not to be transformed to become acceptable to people. Because we know that the message is intended to transform people that they might become acceptable to God. And so rather than transforming it, changing it, peddling it, using it for our own profit, we simply are to communicate it. And that's what God has called us to do. And that's what he's saying here to Timothy. He said, you will be a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word ashamed speaks of being embarrassed or humiliated. Rightly dividing uh, uh, speaks, speaks of, of a person cutting something straight. And the thought is to present the Bible clearly, truthfully, without errors, and with an exactness that cannot be refuted. When you take this word, Timothy, give it out properly. Now, there's an inference, and the inference is simply this. False teachers will mishandle the word of God. False teachers are careless in the things that they say, but a genuine teacher is excruciatingly careful in what he says, what he teaches, and how he lives. He's to be handling the Word of God correctly, properly, and communicating it accurately so that people will actually get the Word of God. And so, one, we're to be diligent. We're to be diligent in our pursuit of the Lord that we might be approved by Him. That's what Paul says when he says we live by faith and not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and be home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home, in the body, or away from it. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 18, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. So be diligent in your pursuit of the Lord, that you might be approved by Him. May your life be so in tune to Him, your love be so centered on Him, that it, it actually causes your life to be transformed because of your faith in Him. See, that's the difference between religion and relationship. And we evangelical Christians have a tendency of trying to emphasize this and re-emphasizing this because I believe even in this last day that we're living in, people are still misunderstanding that message. I speak to people who are religious quite often. Religion simply means that you have a higher call or some greater purpose or some driving force and, and you're willing to give up everything for that. So everybody in one way or another is very religious. 
See, the thing is, is we're to worship God. God is not his name. God is his title. We worship our God. So everybody has a God. Everybody has some primary driving force, master passion that you have within you right now that drives you in what you do, whether it's to accumulate wealth, whether it's to gain education, whether it's to be popular, whether it's to lose weight, gain weight, whatever it may be, to be an athlete, to be something uh, 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 of some success in business. All of us have some master passion that we are willing to take our time, willing to take our talent, willing to take our finances, willing to take everything that is within us and invest in that direction we do that whether it's a relationship whatever it may be that is our master passion and that becomes the god of our life it could be an idol because it's the one thing that we do and we do it constantly we think about it constantly we thought about it before we came to church we'll think about it later on it's a master passion of our life it could be a marriage it could be a relationship with a child it could be a relationship with a parent it's the master passion it's a driving force and god says i will have no false gods before me i am to be your master passion and everything else is going to line up behind that now that isn't just a philosophy that isn't something that we just try and find some proof text in here to justify because we believe that. What he's saying is, I want your love for me to be so great that everything else lines up second behind that. Have a relationship with me. Know me. Love me. Some people know their Bible, but they don't know the, the God of the Bible. Some people know some of the commandments, but they don't know the one who gave those commandments, nor do they know the reason why God gave them. And so that we can have fellowship with him. Why? Because sin makes separation. And when I'm in sin, I am divided from him. I don't have relationship with him. And so because it's such a great gap between us, there's a gulf that separate us, separates us. God says, listen, there's nothing you can do on your own that's going to ever be able to atone for the things that, that you have done. Your sins have made a separation. Therefore, because I love you, I will give my son so that he might be able to bring you to me. And that's what the Christian faith is all about. I'm not in love with moral teachings. I'm not in love with simply a teacher. I have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Christianity. So it's not simply having some roster of do's and don'ts. It's a relationship that provokes me to do the things that I do simply because I love him and because this pleases him. And I take my wife Marie out uh, and I want to buy her something. I've learned a long time ago to let her pick it out. Because when I would come home with things that I thought she liked, they inevitably ended up somewhere, you know, in the, I don't know, trash. I mean, she never wears them, never wore anything. I, and, and I finally learned a long time ago, if I want to please her, I allow her to let me know how to do that. Instead of me saying, no, you're going to be pleased with these or you're going to like this doesn't work that way she might smile at me and she may thank me for it but it's going to find its way into some little you know some nook some cranny some place that is never going to be used and i finally learned that a long time ago and i now what i'll do is is i'll say okay honey you know it's our anniversary honey it's this you know what do you want you know or i'll have my kids tell her you know what do you want and they'll and then they'll show me mama likes this mama likes that I hit a hundred you know hundred percent with her I'm batting a thousand because I get what she wants now somebody says well I'll give her what, what I want to give her yeah you can do that if you'd like but you know happy wife happy life man you've got to learn sometime <laughs> it didn't work that way you know I want her to be pleased because it makes me happy when she's happy it just works that way and so if it's true and it is in relationship with your wife or a child or a friend, uh, how much more so when, when we're saying, no, God, I'm going to give you this offering, and the Lord says, but that's not an offering I required. I'm not asking for that. I don't need that. I don't need your, your, your time. I don't need your talent. I don't need anything. God doesn't need anything, but I'll receive it if it's given to me out of love. I'll give it if you give it to me. You know, my, my Josiah, four years old, will give me little things that he's made. I, if you were to see my office, I mean, the whole office is filled with little cartoons and pictures and little things he's drawn. You know, they're, they're never going to be sold in, in, you know, in some, you know, place where you buy beautiful, beautiful art and all of that. It's not going to do that, but, but it's already decorating my heart because it's there in my office. And then I look at it all the time. It's all over the place. There are little drawings and little things that he's done. And, and all, it, it's, it's his heart. He loves his papa. And because he loves me, he gives me something. Do I need that? Absolutely not. Do I need more to clutter up my office? No, I don't. 
then why do I have it? Because he loves me and he gave it to me and I'm pleased with it because it was the best he could do because out of his love for Papa, he gave it to me. You know what? If it's true with my grandson as he gives to me that which, which is from his heart to me, it is also true, and you can find this scripturally, that as I give my heart and my life and my will and my desires to the Lord and I say, I just want to please you, well, that's what God would be saying when he says, love me with all your heart. Love me with everything within you. And that's what we're to do. And that's how it works. And that's what Paul is saying. You need to be uh, diligent in your pursuit, your pursuit to the, of the Lord that he might approve you. And secondly, you, you are to be a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. As a minister, Timothy, be someone who works diligently and accurately and painstakingly as you teach the truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul said, We have denounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So be someone who works diligently and accurately and teach the truth painstakingly. Why? Because it's a benefit to those who hear it. There was a congregational preacher by the name of Joseph Parker who ministered in the late 1800s. And Joseph Parker once said, If we as the church do not get back to spiritual visions, glimpses of heaven, and an awareness of a greater glory in life, we will lose our faith. Our altar will become nothing but cold, empty stone, never blessed with a visit from heaven. And this is the world's need today. Joseph Parker said the world needs our lives to be on fire for Christ. And that was in the 1800s. How much more so now that the church of Jesus Christ should be doing those things that are pleasing to the Lord. So be a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Now, in verse 16, he goes on to say, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Vain, profane babblings, idle babblings, that's worldly human opinion. That's empty chatter. Worldly human opinion and empty chatter produces ungodly lives. You see, that kind of chatter actually appeals to the carnal nature, and as it appeals to the carnal nature, it produces division. Even in, a, in the body of Christ, when idle chatter is, is entertained, it can create division between believers Jude 19, speaking of false teachers, says they are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. And that's what happens. And so Paul has to name two of them. In verse 17, he says, their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of the sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. And so false teaching spreads. It spreads quickly. Notice how he says in verse 17, their message will spread like cancer. It spreads quickly. It's infectious and it's malicious and it destroys. And indeed, does it move quickly? 2,000 years ago, it moved quickly and it moves quicker now. You can have false teaching just by turning on a TV set. You can receive false teaching by turning on a radio. You can have false teaching by, by going into a bookstore and buying books that are written by false teachers. You, you can get it on, in a convention. You can get it in a variety of ways. Magazines, you can get it on, on uh, CDs, DVDs. I mean, it spreads and it spreads quickly. And that's what he says false teaching does. It spreads quickly. But the problem is it's malicious. It spreads like cancer. False teachers. Sometimes they'll even use the Bible. I want you to notice in verse 18 when it says, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying the resurrection's already passed. False teachers can use the scriptures and use them wrongly. It's interesting to me how two of these are mentioned, Hymenaeus and Philetus. For those who take notes, this is the only place you see this man Philetus. He's only mentioned here in scripture. But Hymenaeus has been mentioned before in chapter 1, verse 20 of First Timothy. Paul, a few years earlier, had spoken concerning him and said that he needed to be excommunicated. He needed to be dealt with. It's interesting, though, that his name is brought up again in the same context a few years later, which tells us that Hymenaeus did not repent. He didn't change. He didn't yield to the spirit. He continued in error. And not only that, he continued to influence other people. 
He has deviated from the truth. He has strayed. He has swerved from the truth. He's an unrepentant false teacher, and he continues to influence. Now, the people are being influenced because he is a false teacher, but it's not just his false teachings. There's got to be something else. More than likely, he was charismatic, charming, influential, interesting, eloquent, because those are the ingredients that usually go into the making of a false teacher. People will listen to somebody if, they enter, if they're entertained by him, if he speaks well, if he's handsome, if he communicates with humor. They'll listen all day long to him because they appreciate the way he speaks. Not necessarily what he's saying. They don't understand. Years ago, a professor in one of his classes in a, in a college, it was a class that related to social studies, decided to bring in two people to speak to the class, to lecture them. The first person he brought in was a very esteemed doctor, expert on a subject, and he gave him time to lecture on his subject. The second person he brought in was, a, was an actor, had no idea whatsoever about the content of the topic, but was told, come in and entertain the kids. And after it was done, the college students were given um, the opportunity to grade the speakers. And you know already who won their grading. It was the actor. The actor was eloquent. The actor was humorous. The actor was good looking. He knew how to exchange. He knew how to bring people into his way of thinking and all. And he knew nothing about the subject. Whereas this esteemed professor with doctorates in that subject gave a very solid, solid uh, lecture to them. But the kids were not entertained by it. Well, we're still the same way. If it entertains me, if it's something that makes me laugh, if I like that person, if it's something that, that it, 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 it piques my interest, if, if it's done in such a way as to engage me, then I'm more than willing to listen to that person, even if they have been injecting cyanide into that Kool-Aid. I'll listen to them, even if they're poisoning me because they entertain me. Paul was saying, you need to be careful because these people obviously have an impact in that church. People are listening to them, and unfortunately, they're being infected by the error. Hymenaeus had already been excommunicated, but he has still influenced the people into error. Now, briefly... It isn't unloving to warn people to stay away from bad teachings and bad teachers. You know, sometimes people get upset. In, in this fellowship, I've mentioned that to you before. There was a time when I was a lot more quick to say, look out for this and look, look out for that. And people would get upset because their favorite teacher was being critiqued. But that's not unloving to do. As a matter of fact, as part of the pastor's responsibility, Romans 16 verse 17 says... I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. See, the problem is, is because people think that truth is relative, that person's truth is equal to your truth and there is no absolute truth. That's the reason why, because they don't respect the word of God for what it is, God's declarations from heaven to man. They just look at this book as if it's just a regular book. That's your opinion. That's your interpretation. And therefore, my interpretation is equal to yours, even though I've never read the Bible and you've studied it for years. And that's how people think. That's the way people are. But it's the, the pastor's responsibility to correct error. Somebody might ask, well, so what if they don't teach the complete truth? Why does that matter? Well, we need to remember that, that when you're taught error, it actually undermines your faith and also results in strict judgment. Even a genuine Christian teacher has to take that very seriously, especially a genuine teacher has to take that very seriously, James tells us, let not many of you become teachers knowing that you receive a stricter condemnation. You have a stricter judgment because the one who has received much from him, much is required. And so you give an answer to the Lord. So whenever you stand up and, and speak in the name of the Lord, you have to have the fear of God in you so that you communicate the proper things within context and historically accurate. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, Paul said it this way. Paul said, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. 
If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Your work is placed before the Lord. It's a picture of him having a flame that hits it. The only thing that remains is, is, is what is really uh, un unbreakable. It's the precious stones. But everything else goes up in smoke. It burns because fire burns. During the summer, I decided to go out and do some barbecuing. And so I threw all the coals down in our barbecue and I lighted it and and it flamed up. And so I put the lid over the barbecue and I went into the kitchen for a few minutes, assuming that by the time I went back out that the flame had died down and, and the coals were beginning to become hot so that I could eventually put some meat on the barbecue and all of that. So I walk up to the to the the lid of the barbecue and I open it up, but uh, I didn't realize that it, it hadn't flamed out yet. And so when the oxygen hits the flame, it exploded. And when the flame exploded, it, it burst out from the barbecue. And I was just standing there and it engulfed me. And when it engulfed me, it actually burned my eyebrows. I mean, it burned my eyebrows, burned all the hair off of my arm. Uh, and I was standing like Wiley e. Coyote, you know, smoking, you know. And, and, and I walked into the house, you know, and I, I said, here's your barbecue, you know, because I had just I had just been flamed, you know. And the Lord was saying, you could enter into heaven like that. Some of us are going to just barely make it in there smoking, you know, and the Lord said, oh, you made it. Bad. Look at you, you know, all burned up like that. False teachers may be right about who Jesus is in some ways, but so often they add things to him that he becomes lost Sometimes they'll, they'll just use the name of Jesus. They'll just add his name to their organization. They, they will use scripture sometimes. That's what you're seeing here with Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're speaking of a scriptural thing, the resurrection. But they transform it, they change it, and they undermine faith by removing its truthfulness. And they create a mythology of some sort. I have talked to people who don't seem to understand that truth sets you free and, and error brings you into bondage. They're so busy defending false teachers that they don't realize that, that these false teachers are actually going to stand before God and receive great judgment. But notice verse 19, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. False teachings give false securities. People can be deceived into believing they are saved simply because somebody has communicated something to them that makes them think that they are. So you speak to somebody who says to you, well, of course I'm a Christian because I'm with Jesus Christ, Church of, uh, Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. We even have Jesus' name in our church. Or you speak to a Jehovah's Witness and the Jehovah's will say, Witness will say to you, we are Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. And so a young believer or somebody who's not reading the word will say, well, they sound real to me. They have the name Jesus Christ in there. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name. And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, the fact is, God knows those who truly belong to him. And that's the sure foundation that has that seal. And, and that would speak of the church. The church of Jesus Christ is the foundation and is sealed by the Spirit. And God knows us. In John 10, 14, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and, and, and am known by my own. 1 Corinthians 8, 3, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. And so somebody can say, well, I know him, but that's not, that's not the whole thing. Does he know you? Does he have a relationship with you? That's the key. God knows those who are his. But how can we know that we are his? Well, the second portion, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, people argue all the time about what they call grace. Un Grace is unmerited favor. It's undeserved. It's unearned. It's simply given to us by God. And, and it's something that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. 
But grace is never to be looked at as permission. Like I have permission to continue doing these sinful things because now I'm a Christian. I have spoken to more than one person. Well, you know what? Yeah, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I'm still living with my girlfriend. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I still enjoy my party. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I, I still, you know, do my drugs. And I remember years ago a true story of a, of a gangster in Los Angeles, Billy Graham. It's many years ago now. Billy Graham had come into L.A. and had done one of the Billy Graham Crusades. And this very well-known gangster had um, actually come forward during an, an invitation. And so the organization doing follow-up, the Billy Graham organization doing follow-up, actually was following up on this gangster, a well-known mobster, very well-known. And uh, it had been some time, a few months and all, in between him coming to the Billy Graham Crusade, going forward and all. And so one of the ministers was speaking to him, and... Uh, as they were talking, the minister said to him, you, you haven't walked away from your uh, gangster activities, have you? And he says, well, no, of course not. He says, may I ask you why you haven't? And he said, well, listen, there are Christian businessmen. There are Christian doctors. I happen to be a Christian gangster. It, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work. You know, I kill in the name of Jesus. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and but there are people who have that kind of mentality and so the Bible says no when you have come to know Christ well let him who names the name of Jesus Christ depart from unrighteousness the word iniquity means unrighteousness depart from that in first Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 Paul said it like this he said do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. The person who is following the Lord departs from iniquity. And so Paul is saying, listen, God knows those who are his, Timothy. And when you're ministering, you need to encourage them to live in an unashamed way. May they not be ashamed of the testimony of the gospel. May they not be ashamed of Paul, his prisoner. May they not be ashamed of the body of Christ. May they be part of what has been called the fellowship of the unashamed. Just this week I was reading something that I thought I would read to you where this individual wrote these words. The fellowship of the unashamed. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane, talk, mundane talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I won't give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And that's what God has called us to. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us live in such a way that people know beyond a shadow of a doubt who we worship, who is our Lord, and He makes changes in our lives because of the power of His Spirit and the truthfulness of His, of His message. May God strengthen us to that end so that we might too be part of the fellowship of the unashamed. Our Father, we ask that You would work within us today and strengthen us that we might live lives that bring glory to You. May we not see Christianity as simply a philosophy of life. May we be in love with you. And Father, may we have fellowship with you, identify with you, love you and serve you. And may we do so with all of our hearts. 
Even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, perhaps I have some in this room right now who need to get right with the Lord, and and you know it. I, I want to pray with you, and I want to pray for you. So if you need prayer to get right with Him right now, as we're here, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right now, right where you're at. Our Father, you see these hands that are going up, and you know the reason why they're being raised unto you at this moment. I'm asking now, Lord, that you would reach down and touch these lives. And I'm asking, Father, that as they open up their hearts to you now and say, Lord, I want to be right with you, whatever it may be that is separating them even now is being dealt with, so that they might walk out of this room filled with your grace, your mercy, your, your spirit, your power. Work in them even now, Lord, as they raise their hand to you. Work in them and glorify yourself, Lord, as they receive from you. Wash them and cleanse them. And we thank you, Lord. Bless you. You can put your hands down. Father, keep working in us would be our prayer. In Jesus' name.